Um, all right. Um, so um, my name's Maria. I'm a postdoc in um, Dr. Neil Ferti Containers Lab um, at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And I'm going to be presenting today on behalf of our group, our colleague, um, Curtis Youngkin, and then also our collaborators at NCSA, Luda Mainzer and Victor Younger-Neil, who have been instrumental in um, facilitating our analysis on blue waters. They've really helped a lot. And I'm going to be talking about um, our work on epistatic interactions using a brain expression genome-wide association study and how this might relate to Alzheimer's disease. So I'm just going to start with a brief introduction. Um, Alzheimer's disease, like other complex genetic diseases, is likely influenced by multiple genetic and environmental risk factors. And we hypothesize that some of these factors influence risk for such diseases through effects on gene expression. So the goal of our study is to identify pairs of genetic variants that influence brain gene expression levels, and this is known as epistasis. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first study to analyze brain gene expression data using this kind of approach. So I wanted to start um, with respect to this study um, with some background and also describe why we think this matters. So as many as you, of you probably know, Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. And it was first described in 1907 by Dr. Alzheimer. It presents with memory, language, and other cognitive problems, and these are not normal for age. The, um, it's pathologically determined at autopsy by the presence of an abnormal accumulation of extracellular amyloid beta, shown here, and intracellular neurofibrillary tangles that are primarily composed of hyperphosphorylated tau protein. In advanced cases, there's also significant atrophy of the brain due to neuronal cell loss. At this current time, there are 5.2 million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease, and 11% of the population aged over 65 has AD. When we look at the population aged over 85, almost one-third of people are living with AD, and it is the fifth leading cause of death for people aged 65 and older. It is estimated that without any treatments that can either delay the onset or provide some kind of a cure for the disease, um, that by 2050 the incidence of Alzheimer's will have almost tripled. Currently there are five FDA approved drugs that can provide temporary relief in some patients, however none of these um, slow or stop the disease progress. There's also some non-pharmacological approaches aimed at improving the quality of life by managing symptoms, however, again, these do not cure or prevent the disease. So we're interested in the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. And the reason that the genetics is so important um, is because we can learn a lot about the disease through understanding the genetics. For example, there's a rare early onset familial form of the disease, and there's mutations in three genes, APP, presenilin-1, and presenilin-2, that are known to directly cause this form of the, uh, of the disease. And these all function through increasing levels of the amyloid beta peptide, which is the primary component of those extracellular plaques I um, illustrated earlier. And so from this knowledge, we learn a lot about the pathophysiology of the disease. We can also use this knowledge to predict who is at risk or who will get the disease, specifically in these early onset families. Um, if these people can um, be told that they have a mutation in one of these genes, we can predict who will um, get disease. And in the future, when there's um, therapies um, that have been developed, we can target these people with these therapies. Um, in the case of the more common late onset form of the disease, um, there are no causal mutations, but we do know from twin studies that up to 80% of the risk for the late onset form is due to genetic factors. And many of you have probably heard about the APOE gene. Um, so this was discovered almost uh, about 20 years ago now. But in more recent years, um, large genetic studies have identified an additional 20 novel genetic loci, and these are illustrated here, that either increase risk for um, late, the late onset form of the disease, shown in the red stars, or decrease risk of the disease, shown in the green stars. However, um, as I mentioned earlier, none of these are causal variants. These um, alter the disease susceptibility, but do not directly cause the disease. 
And despite these advances um, in late onset Alzheimer's genetics, um, there's still a substantial knowledge gap. So we don't know what these genetic variants do, like what's the function, how, what's the mechanism of action, how do they influence the risk for the disease. And also, there's still some missing heritability. Collectively, the, all these genetic variants account for less than 40% of the risk for AD, and so there's still additional genetic factors that are um, left to be found. And we can address this knowledge gap through the use of endophenotypes. So we can leverage endophenotypes such as gene expression to identify additional genetic factors and also determine the mechanism of action of the known factors. So we um, were able to address this question um, using a brain expression genome-wide association study where we identified about 3,000 variants that significantly influenced or significantly associated with gene expression levels in the brain. And we found that these 3,000 variants were significantly enriched for variants that likewise influenced, influenced risk of Alzheimer's disease. We can also use this approach to ask the question, do the known genetic risk loci influence um, levels of brain gene expression? And we found that actually, in fact, many of those 20 variants that I described on the previous slide do, in fact, associate with um, gene expression levels of nearby genes, getting us to somewhat of a mechanism of action. So our study that we're conducting on Blue Waters builds upon this um, brain expression GWAS study. So I'm just going to describe some of the methods um, behind it before I get to um, what we were working on on Blue Waters. So um, for this study and our expression study, we isolated RNA for gene expression and DNA for genetic variant calling from frozen brain tissue um, for um, about 200 subjects with AD and 200 subjects with non-AD pathologies. And we isolated RNA and DNA from the temporal cortex and cerebellum because the temporal cortex is largely affected by AD pathology and the cerebellum is largely spared. We can conduct the analysis um, using the various groups of subjects. So we can look for associations just in the AD group, just in the non-AD group, or in both groups combined. And we can replicate this association in the cerebellum. So here we would call them groups four, five, and six. So we collected genotypes for about 300,000 common genetic variants distributed throughout the genome so that you would imagine that every subject would have one of, po one of three possible genotypes at all 300,000 points. And then the phenotypes were looking at gene expression levels, and we measured these using the Illumina Whole Genome Dazzle um, for 24,526 probes that represent about 18,400 genes. And if you can imagine this example, where we have gene expression levels on the left, and then the three different genotypes along the bottom, and here we're looking at subjects who are homozygous for the A allele, and you can see that they have significantly lower levels of the gene that we're targeting than the subjects who either carry or are homozygous for the C allele. And interestingly, this variant that I'm showing you is actually one of the AD risk loci. And here we're showing that this AD risk, loci, um, AD risk SNP is associating with significantly higher levels of a nearby gene. So why are we talking about epistasis? Well, the single SNP, single phenotype approach is overly simplistic and cannot fully explain the known heritability of the various diseases and phenotypes that we study. Epistasis allows us to study the interaction effects of pairs of SNPs on a given phenotype and can allow us to uncover additional genetic factors that influence gene expression and disease. So if we go back to that previous example where we were considering one variant with three possible genotypes and looking at our subjects that way, if we now consider an additional variant and look at the interaction effects, we're essentially putting the um, pop subjects in our study into nine possible bins. So what are some of the key challenges associated with this kind of study? Well, the computational resources increase quadratically with the number of SNP interactions being considered. How do we compute um, analysis of 300,000 times 300,000 epistatic interactions and for 24,000 phenotypes? We also need to account for um, covariates. This is especially important for gene expression studies where there's many technical variables that can account for a lot of the variants of the phenotype studied. 
and unfortunately the statistical applications that facilitate analysis of epistatic interactions do not allow for incorporation of covariates and regression analysis, so we had to get a little bit creative there. And finally, storage. Epistasis analysis on the scale that we describe here generates large amounts of data, and this must all be stored and organized. So this takes us to why blue waters. So blue waters can help us address some of these computational and storage um, issues. So on our um, academic clusters, we propose to run the analysis using a software called Plink, and we could run the phenotypes one at a time with an estimated time penalty of 75 hours per phenotype. In contrast, on Blue Waters, we're able to execute a uh, more sophisticated piece of software that allows for um, studying multiple phenotypes at once. It's specifically designed to be um, applied for this kind of high throughput study, and it builds upon the um, algorithms in Plink, but improves the uh, efficiency of the analysis. And we're able to um, opti optimally run 32 phenotypes at a time. And for our first set of analysis for group one, um, this actually took less than two days to run, which is a huge, huge time saver. Um, additionally, uh, we uh, had issues with storage, so simultaneous fast epistasis computation on increasing number of phenotypes quickly saturates the aggregate disk I.O. on standard academic clusters such as, that, such as ours, and the intermediate files generated quickly add up to hundreds of terabytes per analysis. And this was all easily handed, handled by the Blue Waters Petabyte Storage Facility. So before we could run the analysis, we had to prepare the data. So I'm just going to briefly take you through some of the approaches that we did for that. So we started with just over 300,000 SNPs. We applied um, standard genome-wide association um, QC parameters, and this reduced the number of SNPs slightly. We then decided to focus just on the diploid um, chromosomes, and we applied even more stringent quality control measures on um, the SNP data and looked um, at slightly, uh, we restricted our minor allele frequency to 5%, which is a little bit higher than the regular 2%. Um, we then wanted to remove redundancy, so many SNPs will be close to each other and they essentially represent the same thing. So we LD pruned our data um, and we got the number of SNPs down to 223,632. We then also wanted to make sure we were looking at a truly homogeneous population sample. So we did some um, principal components. Um, and on this figure, you see that Caucasian population is represented in black. A Yoruban population is represented in this teal color. And then our samples are scattered between the two. And so we removed these samples that perhaps weren't um, completely Caucasian um, so that we ended up with a homogeneous sample set. And then to get around the um, covariate issue, we, gen we generated residuals for all the phenotypes. So we ran linear regression in R, took account for all the significant um, covariates, and then generated residuals and used those as the input phenotypes. So what are some of our accomplishments? Um, well, NCSA senior scientist Luda Mainzer determined that fast epistasis runs most optimally with 32 phenotypes at a time. And she designed um, a launch code to um, run fast epistasis on blue waters. And we're also working with the author of um, blue, uh, fast epistasis, Terry Schuchbeck, um, to make further improvements and tailor the application a little bit to our needs. We did some testing to make sure that Plink and fast epistasis gave us the same results. Um, and here I show the correlation between the p-values for SNPs run on Plink, p-values um, for fast epistasis, for three of the probes that we looked at and found perfect correlation. And we've now successfully completed the first of the six groups of analysis um, for the temporal cortex AD samples. So some of the future directions are that we're going to complete analysis of the two additional groups, um, the non-AD samples and then the combined AD and non-AD in temporal cortex. And then we'll look at the cerebellum for the same three groups um, for replication. We also need to apply filters to our data and with respect to counts for the genotypes um, and additional filtering. And then we also um, are collecting data on many, of, uh, many hundreds of additional um, brain samples, um, collecting gene expression data using RNA sequencing. Um, and so we really hope that we'll be able to apply this approach to those samples also. So I'd like to thank the patients and families who so generously donate their brains for research upon their death. 
uh, my colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, our collaborators at UIC and NCSA, and Terry um, for, Thierry for um, his collaboration, um, and then also our research support, um, especially the private sector program for supporting this analysis on blue waters.